morning, Mr. Keating. You may My name is uh, uh, Kevin Keating, and I represent uh, David Brower. Uh, this uh, disciplinary proceeding has resulted in a recommendation of uh, an indefinite uh, <laughs> suspension. The proceeding arises out of a uh, civil trial that occurred in the Norfolk Superior Court back in 2000. Uh, at which time uh, Mr. Brower was uh, found responsible for uh, conversion. Uh, there was an appeal, and uh, the uh, appeals court affirmed the judgment of the Superior Court in respect to the uh, conversion uh, matter. We argue that the board below erred in applying collateral estoppel uh, to the uh, petition for discipline that was filed in, in uh, this case. The petition for discipline tracked the, the uh, 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 Superior Court uh, findings, and by the way, that was uh, Judge McHugh of the uh, uh, Superior Court. The facts giving rise to this case occurred back in 1996. Uh, the trial was in March of 2000. The appeal was uh, resolved in 2003, and this petition uh, for discipline was filed in uh, 2004. At all times, uh, with regard to the uh, Board of Bar Overseers matter, the uh, uh, respondent was represented by attorney uh, Richard Zissen. I filed my appearance in this matter in, in June of uh, uh, 2005, well after the uh, uh, board had, uh, the special hearing officer to be precise. But, but, but Mr. Keating, you didn't, you didn't, um, you filed your appearance in June, which seems to me one, Bar Council and others could reasonably infer you were therefore on the case, working on the case, and uh, as I understand it, you didn't seek uh, an expert until late in September, isn't That's that right? That's correct. Uh, the, 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 I, I uh, w w filed an appearance to assist uh, Dick Zisson, who was su suffering from uh, health problems at the time. He's since uh, uh, deceased. Uh, and I didn't become actively involved until uh, late August, early September of uh, 2005. But I mean, what, isn't it just in terms of keeping proceedings going? If if a person, an attorney, files an appearance, it seems to me the system can expect that the attorney is on the case and doing whatever needs to be done. Uh, all right. Uh, I, I, again, uh, I, I hope you understand that that uh, uh, Dick Sisson was handling the case. He was responsible for the case, and he intended on trying the case. I, I was only in, involved in, in, in an ancillary matter or an ancillary fashion uh, to, to, uh, to assist him. And it wasn't until uh, late August or early September of 2005 that it became apparent that his health condition would not permit him to try the case and I had to take it over. And it was at that point that I uh, became uh, uh, involved. Uh, perhaps I should have been involved be before that, but in any event, the long and the short of it is I moved for a continuance at that point when I, when I uh, uh, became actively involved and uh, because I, my, my reading of the trial transcript, that is the Norfolk Superior Court trial transcript, uh, led me to conclude that th th there was certainly a potential for a conflict of interest in the, in the uh, sole representation of Mr. Brower at, at, the, uh, at, the, uh, tri at the trial level. What, what can you spell that out for me a little bit, what the <coughs> potential conflict would be? Well, uh, the, 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 the tri trial counsel uh, introduced, for, for whatever reason, the, the record of the, um, uh, l l let me back up. M m Mr. Browers, or the respondent's father, had gone into the uh, Dedham District Court and, and secured a, uh, uh, an order of sorts uh, relative to uh, establishing an escrow account with regard to the money that he was owed, $77,000. And the trial counsel in the Superior Court introduced the record of that proceeding in, in, into evidence. Uh, that proceeding, in, 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 in my judgment, had no bearing on whether or not that there, there was a conversion uh, and wh whether or not Mr. Mr. Brower, the respondent, uh, believe that the funds that he held were the property of his client, Commonwealth Snack. And uh, the, the record of that proceeding was introduced, as, as, as I read it, 
on behalf of his father, who was also a defendant in the uh, 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 civil action in the Superior Court, or his company was a defendant in the civil action in the Superior Court. But I, just, I'm just going on the findings of Judge McHugh. I, I think I'm right that he found that your client, the respondent, had um, uh, basically delayed returning the money. He to inferred that. Okay. There so, was so one. There was one. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I, I guess this was my, my my question. It would seem to me then that Gen Grand Pacific Finance was going to introduce that that evidence to show that your client, take it their position would be that he did delay, they wanted the judge to draw that inference, he did delay, they would say, um, uh, sending back the money in order to allow the um, uh, injunction to enter or to some, you know, some kind of prejudgment security order to enter in the Dedham District Court. J judge, f f first of all, the, the, the conclusion that there was delay here was an in inference drawn by Judge McHugh. But isn't that a finding the of fact? I infer from this that? Isn't that a finding I of fact? I infer and therefore I find is the exact words he uses, I think. I, I don't believe so. Uh, there was, w at the trial before Judge McHugh, there was one question asked of the, of the respondent relative to the district court <laughs> matter, and that was whether he was aware of it. It was a non-issue in the, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, 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 trial. And he could have reasonably drawn no inference in the area of, of uh, delay. What I'm saying is that the, the issue relative to the uh, uh, Dedham District Court action was not essential to the judgment of the Superior Court and that therefore under the, under the uh, uh, doctrine of collateral estoppel, uh, should not have been a fact relied upon by the Board of Bar Overseers. Uh, f first of all, it was never litigated, uh, the, the uh, matter pertaining to the district court uh, before the Superior Court, and that it wasn't essential to, to a judgment of uh, uh, conversion. Uh, that brings me to, to the my, my, the, the thrust of my, uh, of my argument in this case, and that is that in applying, the, the court erred, or the uh, Board of Bar Overseers erred in, in uh, invoking uh, collateral estoppel because it did not have before it the record, the trial record of the uh, civil action, or for that matter, the appellate record of the uh, uh, civil action. There was no way from the documents that it had and those were furnished to the uh, uh, special hearing officer in the uh, uh, petition for discipline, the findings of the Superior Court, which I admit were 22 pages long, and the opinion of the appeals court. But, but now, is it, isn't the real question here whether the complaint that was filed in the Superior Court sufficiently identified the issue and, and whether the findings made by the judge essentially establish whether or not uh, collateral estoppel should apply. The complaint of the, of the uh, 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 trial court was not before the Board of Bar Overseers. The only record before the Board of Bar Overseers was the opinion of the uh, Superior Court, or the findings and rulings of the Superior Court, and the opinion of the uh, Appeals Court. But isn't it clear from the findings of the Superior Court judge um, th that the issue that for which collateral uh, estoppel was sought to be applied had been fully litigated. The only way you could determine that is to, is to review the trial transcript of the, of the Superior Court. What I'm saying to you is that the issue relative to the Dedham District Court and, and his father's involvement in, uh, the respondent's father's involvement in the Ded Dedham District Court was a non-issue with but the you're trial. Saying, you're saying but that we have to review the, tri the trial transcript in every case where collateral estoppel is going to be applied. I believe so. We've so already said that that's not true. I'm not aware of that. Well. Mr. Keating, I if the judge makes, as he does, on page 28 of volume 1 of the appendix, if the judge says, I infer and therefore find that he, that is your client, did not issue instructions because he was aware of the Deknos action and wanted to give Giblin, the lawyer, uh, an opportunity to obtain a court order effectively attaching the money uh, Deknos claimed it was owed. 
I mean, that's a pretty specific finding, isn't it? But it's, it's, it's an inference. The, the, the whole issue of delay in, in the Superior Court finding was, was an inference drawn from, from uh, I, I assume, the conduct of the respondent in not a, immediately returning uh, the funds within 24 hours or, or f 48 hours, as, as, it, as it turned out. <coughs> In, in, in any event, um, I, I do uh, uh, believe that the cases of this court hold that, that in, in the uh, situations involving the application of collateral estoppel, that it is indeed necessary to review the prior record. And that wasn't done here. And I can't and remember, was, did, did your client submit the prior record? Yeah. After I, I ultimately submitted it, in August of 2005, months after the, the uh, hearing officer had, had uh, uh, allowed the motion for preclusion and, and issued his order relative to uh, uh, preclusion. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 I did so in the hope that it would uh, foster a, a uh, re-examination uh, and, and examination of, of the record, which it did not. Uh, was that in connection with your motion to reconsider that you filed the whole transcript? In August of, of 2005. Um, so, so un, un, under the circumstances of, of, of this case, especially in light of uh, uh, the, the expert that I had retained, attorney Mike Keating, and there's no relationship there, um, we should have been given an opportunity to to uh, uh, d develop this issue of a, a, a uh, conflict to demonstrate that the application of collateral estoppel would not have been uh, fair under the, under the uh, uh, circumstances. If there are no further questions. Well, yeah, there's a, there's, I mean, one of the things um, that is pointed out in the decision of the BBO panel um, is that uh, you have not pointed out, your client has not pointed out anything in the transcript of the proceedings uh, that would have made the result in the dis disciplinary proceedings any different. In other words, you sort of, I guess, offer the transcript, but well, don't say, well, here's, here's something that's important in there that would make a difference in whether the collateral estoppel should be applied. I, 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 t I took the position that, that since the uh, uh, motion uh, on the issue of uh, on issue preclusion had been resolved without benefit of the transcript that there was little point in in going forward and and uh, uh, readdressing the issues that I raised in in August on the motion for uh, reconsideration okay. um, thank you just I had one question what assuming that the um, uh, the court were to decide that the use of collateral estoppel was uh, legitimate. With respect to the issue of sanction, all right. Would you uh, just address that? Thank you for uh, r uh, reminding me. Uh, during the pendency of this matter, the, the Hilson case was uh, decided by uh, uh, the court, and um, uh, it, it uh, a, a reading of it uh, precludes. Uh, or, or establishes uh, the sanction of uh, uh, indefinite suspension in, in the event of a uh, third party uh, conversion. And by third party, I'm distinguishing between conversion of clients' funds. Um, all the cases, not only Commonwealth, uh, in Ray Barrett that was decided uh, uh, before Hilson, but also the decisions relied upon in Hilson for the proposition that a uh, third party conversion, uh, uh, the appropriate <laughs> sanction is, is uh, an indefinite suspension. They all involve, a, with one or two exceptions, they all involve a case where there was a defalcation, if you will, along with deceit and misrepresentations. Here there was no deceit and misrepresentations. He, he, he thought that he had a right to take, that is the respondent, had a right to take the funds, and he did. He did nothing to cover it up. 
He did nothing surreptitious. It was all above board and, and, and out front. How can you say that when he had been instructed by the person, the entity, that had told him to hold the funds in escrow to wire the funds back again? His position was that the funds belonged to his client once they were deposited in the... But they didn't. An escrow agreement, they don't belong to the client. You hold them in escrow until things are sorted out. That's basic. Well, that, that's what, what his, his posture was, that the funds belonged to his, his client. One, once they uh, uh, were transferred from the uh, uh, China Bank in New York... Did he take them into escrow? Did he agree to hold them in escrow? Yes, he did. Well, then how can you say they belong to his client? Because escrow presupposes that they don't get given to the client until certain conditions are met. And, oh, by the way, if you have a question about that, go to court. <coughs> they're, not your cl they're not your client's money. Right. I mean, that's like saying, you know, we, we, we're going to enter into a PNS. Please hold the funds in escrow. The PNS isn't executed, but the funds belong to the seller. If that's, Mr. Keating, that's not the law. I mean, that didn't belong to his client. Well, th that, that was his, his feeling at the time. Well, that comes pretty close to deception. I mean, it may have be a feeling, but lawyers can't have feelings. Uh, I'm sorry? Lawyers can't Wait have feelings. They have to follow the law. <laughs> <laughs> they may have feelings about other things. <laughs> lawyers don't have feelings, no. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, I don't, I'm not being flippant here. I understand. I understand. Okay, thank you, Mr. All right, thank you. Mr. Geller. Good morning, Your Honors. Roger Geller for the Office of Bar Counsel. It's our position, and we request this court to adopt the findings of the Board of Bar Overseers that it was appropriate in this case to apply collateral estoppel and to establish uh, facts that were, uh, that were found by Justice McHugh in the Superior Court. Uh, underlying litigation. Uh, we also ask you to uh, accept the board's recommendation that the appropriate sanction for this conduct is an indefinite suspension. Um, I, I take it, Mr. Geller, that even, even were <coughs> we to agree with Mr. Keating that that <coughs> part of, of Judge <coughs> McHugh's findings, which are very detailed and, and specific, that relate to um, the trustee, uh, you know, the motion for, uh, you know, the, uh, on behalf of Mr. Brower Sr., you know, to go in and attach uh, those funds, um, that there's sufficient that suggests, and in fact, Mr. Keating has now just told me why his client did this, was that even though instructed by the person who had handed over the funds, namely the New York Bank, to Mr. Brower Jr. to send them back, that he declined to do that um, for whatever reason, correct? He, he not only did he have receive instructions from the New York Bank, but he also received specific instructions from his own client. Correct. Um, so, uh, and, and now we hear that he didn't do that. He didn't do that. Because he thought they were his, or they thought they were his clients and therefore his legal fees could be paid Justice from them. Justice McHugh found that he did this to delay uh, so that his father would have time to No, no, to I understand that. But even if, you, even if you say that, you know, that may have been one, another reason for, for, a reason for delay, there was at least another reason going on, namely that he wanted to get his own fees paid out of it. In fact, that's in fact what happened. Uh, he not only... Uh, delivered to his father $77,000 uh, pursuant to the, the Norfolk District Court order. He also engaged in self-help. He, he delivered them or the, or the funds were just attached? Both. He put them into a separate escrow account as was ordered by the Norfolk District Court. It was, it was similar to an attachment, a prejudgment no, but attachment. At a, at a later point after judgment entered, because nobody said that the exactly. Commonwealth yeah. snack was in bankruptcy, he the money was delivered. He turned them over to delivered. his father, yes. Uh, but he, he also engaged in self-help. Uh, he was owed nineteen thousand dollars by uh, by the client. Uh, he took that money for himself for past legal fees that he was entitled to. He, he believed, and he also took another four thousand dollars, approximately, for future legal fees. W was so he identified as a trustee defendant in the district court case? Yes. 
and, and, and he filed an answer as trustee defendant? He did not appear in the district court case. He did not once. He, was, uh, he received the order. He did not bother to tell the district court okay. that these funds did not belong to Commonwealth SNAC, but that they were escrow funds. Well, he, he would have told, he, he may have told, the, had he appeared, he apparently might have told the court that they did belong to, co to Commonwealth SNAC. He might have, but that's speculation. We no, know no, I that he didn't because he, go to he's, court his and lawyer, he never told the court. His lawyer is here today saying that he believed, he felt that he, the, the funds belonged to his client. Well, uh, so, so, so it, it, I mean, let, let's play this out as the chief was suggesting. W if, if he had filed an answer, he sh the answer, I take it, should have said either, I'm ho I, yes, I am holding funds, but they don't belong to the plaintiff in the case, and he never filed such an answer. He never filed such an answer, and were he to have said that these funds uh, don't or, or do belong to uh, Commonwealth snack, that would have been uh, a misrepresentation to the court because he knew the circumstances under which he had received these funds. He knew that they were, he had been, received them for one purpose and one purpose only, which was to set, to settle a lawsuit against his client uh, and that the funds could not be released without uh, the approval of the New York Bank. But if he had a legitimate or a good faith belief that the funds w were available for the use for his use and his, and his client's use, he could have filed an answer to that effect. He could have, but he would have had to explain that answer. But uh, I, I'm misunderstanding here. I, I thought once the funds were wired to him, uh, he may have been holding them as in escrow, but he was actually authorized to pay them to the settle to settle the case. If that case had settled, he didn't need further authorization. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Bank, I don't believe that's right, Your Honor. Uh, I believe that uh, the funds were to be held so that uh, the person who was suing his client would know that there were funds available to settle the case. Well, I thought the funds were settled really just before the settlement was actually supposed to be executed and then it got messed up. The facts as found away. by Justice McHugh were that the funds, he told uh, his client and the bank that he believed he could settle the case for $750,000. He asked for those funds to be made available for settlement and uh, that although the case was settled in principle, it was not a final settlement. Um, so he, he would have had to get further authorization from China Bank to actually pay the $750,000 as the settlement. I believe that's uh, consistent with I, Justice I didn't read McHugh's it that way, findings. but you may be right. Now, we also uh, would, would suggest to the court that the uh, request for a continuance was properly uh, denied as a, uh, an exercise of the special hearing officer's um, discretion. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Brower sat on his uh, rights and, and at the last 11th hour uh, came up with the uh, uh, witnesses and uh, a rationale for needing a further extension in this case and there is no error in allowing that uh, uh, continuance, and I think that it's pretty clear that uh, Mr. Brower received these funds in the context of his legal representation of Commonwealth Snack. He was an escrow agent, uh, and he uh, converted these funds uh, without any legitimate purpose. Um, there was uh, a deceit found uh, by Justice McHugh and uh, by the board uh, in Mr. Brower's failure to bring to the court's attention the true circumstances of the escrow and how the money came to be in his possession. He had a conflict of interest uh, in his own interest in getting uh, his fees paid uh, and all of this uh, misconduct warrants the indefinite suspension that the board recommended. I, I thought you were asking for a, 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 a disbarment. No, we asked for an indefinite suspension, Your Honor. Okay. I'm just going and looking at Judge Judge McHugh's findings. It said, when China Bank <coughs> wired the funds to Brower and Brower account, GPFC was reasonably under the impression that the Dewey settlement had been achieved in principle and the settlement funds would be transferred to Dewey almost immediately. There's nothing in here about after they were transferred that Mr. Brower would then have to seek further authorization to no, in but fact, it, transfer but it does them to the settlement account, I mean to transfer them to settle a case. 
but it, it does say that any variance from the use of the fa this no, I understand that. Yeah, I'm just so asking I, whether there was further require further authorization necessary to in fact use the funds to settle the case. Th that may not have been the case. Okay. Um, however, when the, when the China Bank and I understand uh, that Snack asked to have the money returned uh, because there had not been the settlement. Mr. Brow was obligated to turn, return those funds. Was, it, was there a settlement executed? No. There was never any, exec, uh, any final settlement. So no. those funds should still be in escrow? They, they were returned to, to the bank, Your Honor. No, I understand. <laughs> they could still be in escrow, yes, Your Honor. That's where they properly belong. Yes, Your they're Honor. They're either back with the bank or they're in escrow. Except that the bank, the, the, the two. No, no, I understand what happened, but, uh, but if you're yes. holding funds in escrow pending a settlement, you do one of two things. You wait until there's a settlement or you give them back if the settlement Absolutely. seems to be going down the tube. Thank you, Mr. Gary. Thank you very much. Take a short break. <laughs>